All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, great to see you all. So tonight we're going to study another sutta, another teaching from the early collection. Uh, we're going to be diving back into the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. Uh, we're going to be jumping over to sutta number 69 this evening, the Gulisani Sutta. Uh, the teaching given to, or actually it's kind of actually about, the monk named Gulasani. Um, so a couple of things real quick about the sutta. Thanks, Noam, for putting the link in the chat. A um, couple of things about the sutta. So this is a, a little sutta, tiny little, just a few pages. And there's like one thing in particular about it that I want to kind of like, I kind of want to start with in a way. And what it is, is, is that this is one of those, you know, early Buddhist suttas, which isn't actually a teaching of the Buddha. Tonight, it's another one of the suttas, and we've encountered this before, but it's another one of the suttas where the, it's a record of the teachings of Sariputta or Shariputra in the Sanskrit. Um, and so this is one of those interesting suttas or one of those records where it's actually preserving this sort of discourse or a teaching that was given by a student of the Buddha. Now, Sariputta is not just any student, of course. He's considered sort of like the primary teacher of a lot of the monks in that way, like sort of, if you had a question, you should go to Sariputra, don't go to the Buddha, go to Sariputra in that way. And I actually, I wanna start, just because I know many of you or many of us out there are familiar with a lot of suttas or a lot of teachings of the Buddha. And so tonight, the teaching being given by Sariputra I kind of actually want us to keep in mind that in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, one sutra in particular that you should all be familiar with, and of course, what I'm talking about is the famous Heart Sutra, right? The Prajna Paramita Heart Sutra. And that's an interesting sutra because, well, I mean, it's interesting for a lot of reasons, but it's interesting because in it, there's a bodhisattva na named Avilokiteshvara who's talking to Shariputra. And what you may not know is that that's actually kind of an interesting comment or commentary on these early Buddhist suttas where Shariputra was running around kind of telling everybody what to do. He was sort of like this uh, authority figure, if you will. And so the Heart Sutra is actually more radical than I think a lot of people know, because even having Shariputra being spoken to as a student by the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara is very significant. But you might not get the significance of that uh, role reversal if you weren't familiar with these early teachings where Shariputra is an authority figure in that way. So I just want to kind of mention that for me, I want to read this sutta tonight as, you know, our continuing exploration of the world of Buddhism, the culture, the obviously the teachings and the ideas. But I guess what I'm getting around to is that this sutta is actually really interesting for describing what the world of Buddhist practice was like at the time of the Buddha. <laughs> so my point is, is we're diving into this tonight, not exactly for the teachings, but kind of for the world that it's presenting to us. Now, there is a teaching, there is something for us to gain from this. And so we'll kind of, that'll be revealed as we go through it. 
But I just wanted to start us off with that. It's like right away, the alarm bells should be ringing. These are not the words of the Buddha. They're the words of Sariputra, and they should be understood as such. Um, I, I mention this a lot, that we should always be very mindful in Buddhist uh, suttas. We should be mindful of who is saying what to who. Like, that's always really significant. So it's not that we just take every single word <laughs> as scripture, as they say, right? So, uh, but let's dive in because, again, there's a lot of interesting ideas to talk about. So this is our little sutta number 69 in the middle length discourses. Uh, I'm over on page 572 if you happen to have the book. Otherwise, just kick back and relax. So our little Gulasani Sutta starts like all suttas, of course. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. And we've encountered many sutras that take place at the squirrel sanctuary. Some of my favorite sutras take place at the squirrel sanctuary. But on this particular occasion, a monk, a bhikkhu, named Gulasani, a forest dweller of lax behavior, had come on a visit to stay in the midst of the Sangha for some business or, or something else. <laughs> the Venerable Sariputra addressed the bhikkhus with reference to the bhikkhu Gulasani, saying this, Friends, when a forest-dwelling bhikkhu comes to the Sangha and is living in the Sangha, he should be respectful and deferential towards his companions in the holy life. If he's disrespectful and undifferential towards his companions in the holy life, there will be those who would say of that bhikkhu, what is this forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he is disrespectful and undeferential towards his companions in the holy life? Since there are those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu who has come to the Sangha and is living in the Sangha should be respectful and deferential towards his companions in the holy life. All right, so this is actually going to be the first of, I think, let's see, yeah, it's going to be the first in 17 steps that Sariputra is going to take us through. And the first of these is about being respectful and deferential towards our companions in the holy life. But before we get into that, I want to talk quickly about this distinction between a forest dwelling monk. And then the other monks, the non-forest dwelling monks, like what's up with them? <laughs> so interestingly, and I'll give you just a little bit of background on this. So yes, in the suttas, a distinction is made between forest dwellers and non-forest dwellers. But then I also want you to know that in the kind of historical record, and I'm talking about the historical record from around, you know, 100 BC, 100 AD, like that really kind of, you know, we're talking a few hundred years after the lifetime of the Buddha. I'm talking about records that are coming from like Central Asia, Gandhara, what is now Afghanistan. And all of these historical records from very northern India, even all the way up into Afghanistan, even at that point, so hundreds of years after a sutta like this would have, you know, been recorded, in the historical record, they also talk about there being these forest dweller monks and the city dweller monks. And so I guess the, the point I'm making is, is that the distinction that's presented here continues on for centuries and centuries. And so what we're talking about 
a forest dweller is an Aranyaka. An Aranya is a forest, and then an a forest dweller or forest practitioner is this Aranyaka. And the opposite of an Aranyaka was basically, uh, it was the majority, by the way, the majority of the Sangha would live in what was called a Vihara. And that Vihara would be very near a city or a village. And so the idea is, is that that, um, that uh, Vihara, that monastery, these eventually become monasteries, but that group living in that Vihara has a relationship with the people of that city. We're going to see this play out in the Sutta, by the way. And so it's sort of like, even though these, these monastics, even though they're not city dwellers, but they are in a little bit because they go into the city almost every day to beg for food and then go back to the Vihara. And that's different than the Aranyaka. And the Aranyaka, the forest dweller, were sort of like, they were basically what we would call, they were doing retreat. <laughs> they were off on their own. Usually they would construct their own like kind of shack, their own dwelling place. Caves were very popular. Hollowed out tree trunks were very popular. But the point is, is that you would just be out on your own and you wouldn't actually be going to beg for food into like a city environment. You'd probably actually be just sort of living off of fruits, uh, gleaned food. And this also comes up in the sutta, by the way. So Gulasani here, the monk or the bhikkhu who's shown up, he's a forest dweller. But not just a forest dweller, he's a forest dweller of lax behavior. So this sutta is about a kind of, you know, somebody who's a little rough around the edges, has been living out in the woods, and sort of, well, doesn't have great behavior in kind of public or in these kind of more social settings in that way. So the idea is, is that Sariputra is telling all of the other bhikkhus, don't be like Gulasani. <laughs> now, as I'm always trying to do with Dharma doors here, I know that you are probably not a renunciant. I know that you're probably a householder. I can see many of you in your houses. So I recognize that we are all not renunciants, but I still think there's a tremendous amount of like really, really good information that we can get out of this, like very practical information, actually. So I was thinking about this even in terms of like, you know, go into somebody's house for Thanksgiving soon <laughs> and you are coming from the outside and going into this sort of environment. And in order to kind of create social cohesion, which is really important to the world of Buddhism, is sort of social harmony, the first step is this sort of respect and deference towards our companions in the holy life. That probably shouldn't, you know, surprise anybody <laughs> that that's being asked, that that's being suggested. But in terms of the sutta tonight, in terms of the teaching, this is one of those, um, well, it's one of those teachings tonight where we want to really pay attention to if you, if you do this, it puts you in a position to do this. And then if you do that, which is resting on the first thing you've done, it puts you in a position to do the next thing. And so the teaching tonight is going to kind of move us all the way to enlightenment. It's going to move us all the way to like the goal in that way. And it all begins by being respectful, in, you know, in the context of this teaching tonight. So 
that's our first uh, Sariputra uh, advice in that way. Yeah, no. Um, I think that I, well, I used to, I thought before tonight that a forest dweller was the same as a Pratekya Buddha. Ah. But you are saying it sounds like I made an assumption that is incorrect. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Noam, because I wanted to actually say something more about the forest dweller. So I'm, I'm glad you brought us back to that. So I happen to have here, this is a really good book. It just came out not too long ago. When did this come out? Oh, actually, 2008. So it's actually a little old now. But here's a good book, which is Bodhisattvas of the Forest and the Formation of the Mahayana. <laughs> And so Daniel Boucher is a great scholar, and this is his one of one of his books. And he's kind of looking at the culture of the forest dwellers. And Gulasani is a forest dweller, but he's an early forest dweller, right? This is very early Buddhism. But Daniel Boucher, as well as Paul Harrison. And this book of essays, Setting Out on the Great Way, is another uh, good book on early Mahayana Buddhism. But bo both of these <clears throat> uh, scholars, both of them basically kind of have a, a theory that the what we call Mahayana Buddhism grew out of the forest-dwelling tradition not the city or you know nearby city sangha group but the forest dwellers and in answer to gnome's kind of inquiry about the pratekya buddha there is also a theory that the pratekya buddha is sort of the precursor to the bodhisattva in a way <laughs> but that same idea of a you know if you're not familiar with the idea of a pratekya buddha a solitary enlightened one the idea is, is that they get enlightened just all on their own. And yeah, I think presumably it's doing remote forest dwelling meditation in that way. So there's a theory that whatever was going on, on out in the forest turned into something very interesting. Or at least, again, that's sort of like the thesis of a book like this. So, so just yeah, to no. clarify, make sure I understand. So uh, uh, Pratekya Buddha's probably were forest dwellers, but not every forest dweller is a Pratekya Buddha. Spoken like a true logician, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, yeah, and that's, a, again, that's a fascinating little world of study, by the way, the whole forest dweller situation. But let's go back to Gulasani. So let's find out what Next is, so no, next up, when an Aranyaka, when a forest dwelling bhikkhu comes to the Sangha and is living in the Sangha, they should be skilled in good behavior regarding seats. And they should do it this way, thinking, I shall sit down in such a way that I do not encroach upon elder bhikkhus and I do not de deny new bhikkhus a seat. Now, if this bhikkhu is not skilled in good behavior regarding seats, there will be those who would say of him, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he does not even know what pertains to good behavior? Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu who has come to the sangha and is living in the sangha should be skilled in good behavior regarding seats. Another little piece of advice we could take to the Thanksgiving table in that way, right? Letting grandpa and grandma and everybody else sit down first, making sure the youngins have a place at the table, right? Being skillful in seats <laughs> seems simple, but again, we're building up. And the idea is, is that if you're coming into a situation and you're disrespectful, non-deferential, and you're just sitting wherever you want, 
it's probably not going to go very well. So, next up. When a forest-dwelling bhikkhu comes to the Sangha and is living in the Sangha, he should not enter the village too early or return late in the day. If he enters the village too early and returns late in the day, there will be those who would say of him, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he enters the village too early and returns late in the day? Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest-dwelling bhikkhu who has come to the Sangha and is living with the Sangha should not enter the village too early or return too late in the day. So this little piece of it, by the way, about entering the village too early to beg for food, this is actually the little bit that connects this sutra to the last few sutras we've done. There's a through line of the last few sutras, which has been about basically uh, protocols around begging for food, um, eating only once a day, eating before noon, doing you know things like that. And so since these suttas in this collection are kind of, they're grouped together by theme, and these are the, the suttas given to the bhikkhus, given to the monks, but they do have this thread of the discourse around taking food. So this one is kind of basically about that idea that there's a kind of prescribed window for when the monks should go beg for food, and it shouldn't be too early when it's dark, and it shouldn't be too late in the day, especially late at night. But we could also take this as not, not arriving to Thanksgiving too early and not arriving to Thanksgiving too late, right? But being sort of cordial and right on time. <laughs> I don't know, perhaps. So. Another one more regarding food, by the way, when a forest dwelling bhikkhu comes to the Sangha and is living with the Sangha, uh, he should not go before the meal or after the meal to visit families. If he goes before the meal or after the meal to visit families, there will be those who would say of him, surely this venerable forest dweller, while dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, must be used to making untimely visits, since he be behaves thus when he has come to the Sangha. Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest-dwelling bhikkhu who has come to the Sangha and is living in the Sangha should not go before the meal or after the meal to visit families. All right. By the way, there's in the early Buddhist tradition, there's a lot of rules about relating to the donors. And a lot of this is about like, basically avoiding preferential treatment. So this idea of like going to the family, say like in the morning and being like, yeah, I'm going to come over later in the day. Like then the idea is, is the family might be like, oh, and that monk who visited me in the morning, he really likes, you know, rice porridge. So I'm going to make rice porridge for him because he's coming later in the day. And that's the kind of thing the Buddha always wanted to avoid. It was always supposed to be very, um, you know, as we've seen in those other suttas, it's like, whatever's in your bowl, that's what you take. So engaging with the families before or after the meal was con kind of considered a no-no. By the way, I did want to say regarding all of these, but in particular, this first little group, there's another thing that is Re, that's connecting this teaching to some the last weeks and the weeks before. And I want you to notice, if you haven't noticed already, there's a very subtle kind of thing going on here about, I guess you would call it reputation, like the reputation of the Sangha. And we've seen this before where what the, what or I guess what Shariputra is talking about is he's a he's concerned that if people see Gulasani, our you know our lax monk, if they see Gulasani doing a bunch of like you know bad behavior, 
It's going to reflect badly on all of the monks. And so we also kind of want to pay attention to that, like, subtle message of the teaching, which is about, like, and, and this was more explicitly stated a couple of weeks ago, but it was about how the, the practitioner should be mindful of their behavior, but not just for their own like edification and their own cultivation, but they should be mindful of their behavior because of the way it would re reflect on their companions in the holy life, as it were. So this is like an important part of the path, actually, is taking others into consideration, right? So I just wanted to stress that. Um, next up, we move away from food and that kind of behavior. And now it's about, Shariputra tells us that when a forest dwelling bhikkhu comes to the Sangha and is living in the Sangha, he should not be haughty and personally vain. If the bhikkhu is haughty and personally vain, there will be those that will say of the bhikkhu, surely this venerable forest dweller while dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, must generally be haughty and personally vain, since he behaves thus when he's, when he's come to the sangha. And since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest-dwelling bhikkhu who has come to the sangha and is living with the sangha should not be haughty and personally vain. Pretty straightforward why we might not want to be that way. Likewise, number six, when a forest-dwelling bhikkhu comes to the sangha and is living in the sangha, he shouldn't be rough-tongued and loose-spoken. If he's rough-tongued and loose-spoken, there will be those that will say of him, what has this venerable forest dwelling gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he's so rough-tongued and loose-spoken? Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu who has come to the sangha and is living with the sangha should not be rough-tongued and loose-spoken. I take rough-tongue to mean sort of, you know, cursing, swearing, that kind of rough language and loose spoken, right? Maybe gossiping, things like that, right? Okay. So now we have like some general behavior, a few things around taking food, now some, you know, about kind of group behavior, not being haughty or vain in that way, not being rough tongued. But then we have when a forest dwelling bhikkhu comes to the sangha and is living in the sangha, he should be easy to correct and should associate with good friends. If he's difficult to correct and associates with bad friends, there will be those who would say of him, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he is difficult to correct and associates with bad friends? Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest-dwelling bhikkhu who has come to the sangha and is living in the sangha should be easy to correct and should associate with good friends. This is another topic we saw in one of the suttas a couple of Sundays ago, and it was about the difference between a bhikkhu who's easy to correct, who basically only needs to be sort of be told once, and then kind of will we'll never transgress in that way again. But then we heard about the ones that are more difficult to correct. And then that was where they talked about the, the ongoing discipline of that person and like this prolonged period of correction, but because they're difficult to correct. And then also associating with good friends rather than bad friends in that way. And this is an idea that it's one of those little, it's one of those little nuggets of early Buddhism that gets picked out and becomes a kind of cornerstone of the Mahayana tradition. And what we're talking about is, is the Kalyana Mitra, 
So the Kalyana Mitra is the good spiritual friend. And there is, of course, the idea of a bad friend, but the practitioner is always being encouraged to associate with Kalyana Mitras. And those are defined basically as those with the same goals of enlightenment, with the same interest in liberation, <laughs> versus people that are really interested in bondage and samsara. <laughs> all right any questions about those because we're moving on to sort of a different category all right so i want to remind you that the idea here is is that you kind of you know you need to be respectful good with seating and these things and all of that is preparatory behavior. Again, it creates social cohesion, but from a Buddhist point of view, all of that behavior creates the proper conditions. And that's, you know, if you really are thinking like a Buddhist in that way, where it's not about a singular cause, it's about causes and conditions, multiple so there's a lot of factors that go into the arising of anything. And so there's this initial period or the initial part of the sutta that's talking about kind of social stuff. But what I want you to notice, and you, if you've read this sutta before, you might not have noticed this. But as soon as we get to, uh, I guess it's paragraph 10 in, in this edition, but notice that after the... Uh, being easy to correct. That one is, it's the language is exactly like before. When a forest dwelling bhikkhu comes to the sangha and is living with the sangha. But with this next one, Sariputra just says, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should guard the doors of the sense faculties. There's no being in the sangha or not being in the sangha. And that kind of marks that we've moved to this new part of the sutta that's about kind of practice, not so much the kind of behavioral conditions for practice. So this one, again, paragraph 10 here, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should guard the doors of the indriya, of the sense faculties. If the bhikkhu does not guard the doors of the sense faculties, well, there will be those who would say of him, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest doing as he likes, since he does not guard the doors of his sense faculties? Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should guard the doors of his sense faculties. So I want to talk a little bit about this because we're, again, we're moving into the deeper practice. So I want us to notice, first of all, that there's a few things to come. For example, the next one is going to be about kind of fasting or eating very little. And then the one after that is about wakefulness, which is actually about kind of staying awake. And then we're going to get into virya, energy. And then we're going to get into like meditation. I say this because guarding the sense doors is not exactly meditation. So uh, it usually, or not usually, but you often see it kind of lumped into being part of the meditation program. But notice how early it occurs here. And so... You know, the word indriya in, in Buddhism, it's translated as faculty. If you're not kind of comfortable with that language of faculty, it's kind of like actually very interesting philosophically and, and otherwise. So a faculty, right, is like an, an, an ability, the, the ability to do something as a faculty. And so... You take the ability to see. 
So if you can see me now, then you have the faculty of sight. You have the ability to see. But you know what's interesting about a faculty, like the ability? It's actually different than the organ, the sense organ. Because blind people, or many blind people, have eyes. They just don't have the faculty of sight. Ah, so there is a difference between the sense organ and the, what the Buddhist would call, in a way, the sense consciousness. So I want us to understand, and this is not a, a kind of so much about the sutta as it's just about Buddhist studies, an indriya or a faculty is the ability. And I say this because the word indriya is used a few different ways in Buddhism. In the most restrictive sense, it refers to the six faculties, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to smell, the ability to taste, the ability to feel tactile objects, and the ability to think. Because again, somebody can have a brain but it cannot be working and there's no faculty of thought. So we are being, or Shariputra here and Buddhist practitioners are being advised to guard the sense faculties. Not exactly the same as guarding the sense organs in that way. And then this is what I mean by that this is sort of coming earlier in our sutta because this is about sort of, well, I kind of talked a lot about this either last week or the week before, but to my understanding of guarding the sense doors, it's sort of about that. Um, well, what I was talking about whenever it was, where it was sort of the idea that the senses are just attracted to what they're attracted to and that you are just the experiencer along for the ride. And that where the senses are just off doing what they're doing, that's not guarding the sense doors. Guarding the sense doors is about being more in control of those faculties and not having every noise disturb us, not having every visual sight get us excited, not having every physical sensation like cold or something cause us anguish. It's about that being on top of the sense faculties. That's sort of what they mean by guarding. And the reason why I'm saying this in, in the way that I'm saying it is that this is supposed to be all the time. This isn't like, oh, I'm going to meditate, hit the timer. Now I'll start guarding the sense doors. No, no, no. We should always be guarding the sense doors in that way. So by the way, I did want to mention, because also I want to mention it because it's coming up. The most restrictive sense of Indriya, as I said, are the six faculties, but Interestingly, if you study what's known as the Abhidharma, right, the kind of more advanced Dharma studies of Buddhism, there's actually 22 faculties. And I say this only to highlight one particular faculty. So among those 22 different faculties, Six of them are our sense organs. There's a bunch of other ones that I won't get into right now, but there are five faculties that are called the five spiritual faculties. And the first of those spiritual faculties is faith or shraddha. As you may know, I translate it as certainty or confidence, like a a confidence in the Dharma, not exactly a faith. But for right now, 
let's just allow shraddha to be translated as faith. What I want you to notice is that the idea of having faith or being confident as a faculty, it's an ability. And the point is, is that just like your sight and your hearing, you can cultivate faculties in that way. So just sort of wanting us to notice that there can be a faculty without necessarily an organ, because there's the ability to have faith, the ability to be concentrated. These are spiritual faculties, not exactly physical sense, sense organ faculties. So, okay, all good on guarding the Indriya. Well, a few more things now. A forest dwelling bhikkhu should be moderate in eating. If they are not moderate in eating, there will definitely be people who will say of them, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he's not even moderate in eating? <laughs> since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be moderate in eating. Now, Real quick, the language here is important because they are not saying not eating. The Buddha definitely was not into starvation. There were plenty of monastic yoga groups that were into starvation. The Buddha was like, nope, we're not doing that. But I do want you to kind of acknowledge or know, you know, the Buddhists are already like the regular bhikkhus are already eating a pretty minimal diet in terms of only eating one meal a day. And if you remember from the sutta a few weeks ago, um, the really good meals are, are dinner. So they're actually eating the worst meal of the culture because the, the monks said like, yeah, breakfast is really good and dinner's really great, but lunch is you know, so-so. Why does the Buddha only want us to eat the so-so meal? <laughs> So my point is, is the Buddhists were already kind of moderate eaters. So the forest dweller being told to be moderate in their eating, I think we're to understand that they're supposed to be bringing it down to an extreme minimum. And this does, uh, it matches up with our information about forest dwelling practices in that way, that they were about very minimal eating, but not starvation. So... That's middle path or middle road kind of stuff. But I do want to point out though that the number the our ninth our ninth uh, criteria here are moderate eating. I do want us to notice that it is considered a um, it's called a dahuta, a an austerity. So this is considered like when you're when you're going into the forest, and you're cutting down on your food, this is considered a form of, of austerity in that way. I say that because the next one is also an austerity. So paragraph 12 here, it says a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be devoted to, quote, wakefulness. And if he's not devoted to wakefulness, there will be those who will say of him, what is this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest doing as he likes? since he's not even devoted to wakefulness. Since there would be those who would say that of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be devoted to wakefulness. So this is actually a little like side interest of mine that I've been exploring. And it's basically like sleep deprivation in Buddhism. <laughs> like if, if I had to write a thesis for like a master's degree or something, it would be sleep deprivation in early Buddhism. I have been noticing a lot of references to sleep deprivation in suttas and other Buddhist writings, that it was another one of those dahutas, the austerities. But I want to share with you, I probably, I don't, I've probably never mentioned this ever. I don't know why I would have ever mentioned this, but just a little interesting aside when I was doing my master's degree, speaking of master's degrees, um, 
I was among a little, uh, this was at the University of Hawaii. Uh, this was from 98 to the year 2000. And I only say this because I'm going to mention a few of my people I studied with. And so if you're out there, hi. But 98 to 2000, University of Hawaii, all of the grad students shared an office. And my neighbor was a grad student. Na his name was Dimitri. I can't remember his last name. But he was doing his master's thesis, and the kind of working title of his master's thesis was, Did the Buddha Sleep? And his research is he was pouring through everything, all the early suttas, all the early Vinaya, all the early texts, and he was trying to find any reference to the Buddha sleeping after he became awakened. There's references to him sleeping before he became awakened, but at least as far as the last I checked, Dimitri, the grad student, couldn't find a single reference to the Buddha sleeping, and actually there's references to him not sleeping. Now, this is sort of like one thing, which is, do Buddhas sleep or not? <laughs> That's one thing. And then there's another thing, which is this kind of um, uh, sleep deprivation in early Buddhism, where there are clearly references to rule, not rules, but suggestions of avoiding sleep. So again, I want to stress it's an austerity. This was not something that was the Buddha suggested for all the bhikkhus, but it was something that it was part of forest dwelling, was you were really actually trying to not fall asleep. So, oh, and if you're curious how that works, you are trying to not fall asleep. And then in your meditations, you are maintaining conscious awareness, but you are allowing the, the mind in that way to rest. So, it's not that you're not resting, but you're never losing conscious awareness. And early Buddhism has a kind of real, what word could I use? They're very like, um, something happens when you fall asleep. It's like that period of blacking out and then moving into a kind of phantasmagoric dream state and then blacking out again and then waking up and kind of not necessarily knowing where you are for a moment. That was all very problematic to developing good continuous states of awareness. Like it, it was very disruptive to black out, have a fantasy, black out again, and then wake up. So there's these dream yoga techniques of just moving into like a very subtle state of consciousness and then back up to like full consciousness. So just want you to know that that's sort of how it works. All right, we still have a ways to go, but we have one more, I would call it pr preliminary or one more like pre-practice. So uh, also a forest dwelling bhikkhu should have virya, should be energetic. If the bhikkhu isn't energetic, there will definitely be those people who say of him, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest doing as he likes since he's lazy? <laughs> since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be energetic. So virya, as you know, it is, it's part of the factors of awakening. It's one of the seven factors of enlightenment. It is, oh, it's one of the four uh, steps to the superpowers, the riddhipada. Uh, it is, it's an essential part of Buddhism. And the basic idea of the idea of the energy, the, the determination as it's often translated as well, it's very simple, but it's essential. 
And what it is, is that you have to put forth the effort to bring about your awakening. <laughs> it, it's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen by somebody doing it to you. It's you have to put forth the effort. And so the idea of being energetic is the drive to stay awake, the drive to eat moderately, the drive to do the meditation that we're about to get into. So that's the kind of importance of virya in that way. Um, by the way, virya, it's also a paramita, right? It's also one of the six perfections. You cultivate virya. And I've been meaning to mention a quick thing about virya. There's a lot of different places that you can cultivate virya. And I just want to share this with you as like a way of thinking about virya, a way of thinking about practice, and just a way of thinking about, you know, behavior. The example that I've been thinking, because so I've been cultivating virya, and I've been cultivating virya by not leaving a dish in the sink. What I mean is, is that it's tempting at the end of the night to just be like, ah, I'll leave the dishes till tomorrow. I'll do them tomorrow. But I've been trying to put forth that extra little bit of effort and just finish them, just do it. And, and I want you to know that that is cultivating virya. It is the little, going that little extra mile. The point of, of all of this, as you know, because I know that you're a good practitioner, so I know that you know this is about conditioning. And the point is, is that if you make it a habit of every night putting it off, you're going to get really good at putting it off. <laughs> We get really good at procrastinating, but, and it might be tricky at first, but if you can muster that extra virya and do it, it won't be as difficult next time. And then if you've done it twice, now we're really conditioning ourselves in a different direction. And so you are cultivating, truly cultivating virya. So. That's my one example. There are plenty throughout the day, but that's a good one. So, all right. So now with that said about Virya, putting forth that extra effort, that brings us to a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be established in mindfulness. Sati or Shmurti in Sanskrit, right? Because if the bhikkhu is unmindful, there will be those who would say of him, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest doing as he likes, since he's not mindful? Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be established in mindfulness. So, of course, sati, shmurti, as it is in Sanskrit, this is the Buddhist word, you know, for meditation in that way. It's transited as mindfulness. We understand it as that fixed, focused attention, not the mind not jumping around, not wavering, but being very focused. Also something that is developed in a conditioning because we are conditioned to jump around. And the more we jump around, the more better we get at jumping around. And so you need to cultivate focused attention. You have to cultivate mindfulness. And you do that by doing it, by staying focused. And then again, I want to kind of like, for tonight, what I want to kind of be stressing is this idea of like, that these are sort of states of being. Notice that it's about being mindful or not. It's, it doesn't say, uh, a, you know, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should practice mindfulness. 
no, no. It's like, no, they should be established in mindfulness. Like, again, all the time. Now, we know, of course, that sati is a formal practice in Buddhism that often has formal established objects of meditation and a whole system. But let's not lose sight that it also is the difference between being scatterbrained or mindful, focused. So that's the idea of the forest dweller being established in mindfulness. Yes, we can take it as that they practice it, but it's also that they are just mindful in that way. I say it that way, I wanted to put it that way because the next one as well, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be samadhihid. So should be concentrated, but the word is samadhi, right? This idea of concentration. And if he's not concentrated, then there will be those that say of him, what is this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest doing as he likes since he's not even concentrated? <clears throat> since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be concentrated. Again, normally doing samadhi is a formal practice. And these are like formal meditative states that you kind of get into. And, you know, I do think that there's a way that we should read the text uh, sequentially, where it's like you do the preliminary behavioral stuff, guard the sense doors, then putting forth the effort you practice sati and sati leads to samadhi. We know this, this is the, the program, this is the way it works. But there's also a way of understanding samadhi as not being mutually exclusive to sati. So there is a way of being both mindful and concentrated. Again, they're not mutually exclusive. Concentrated traditionally is a much deeper meditative state. And in particular, it's a meditative state, as I understand it, it's a meditative state where the subject-object distinction has been dissolved. And the idea of concentrated is more of the idea of sort of uh, oneness. But again, if I, in that way, am not making a distinction between you and I, if I'm not making a distinction between myself and the world, if I am concentrated in that way, does that mean I can't be mindfully focused? <laughs> again, I don't see these as mutually exclusive in that way. At least I don't see it the way they're being presented here as being mutually exclusive. So. Questions about either sati, samadhi, the way they relate. We've had other nights where we've talked at length about samadhi, so. But then, of course, in the traditional Buddhist meditation program, you put forth the virya, cultivate sati, that induces samadhi, and exposure to concentrated states of samadhi bring about prajna wisdom and that's the next one so a forest dweller bhikkhu should be wise if he's not wise there will be those who would say of him what is this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest doing as he likes since he's not even wise since there would be those who would say this of him a forest dwelling bhikkhu should be wise so again, this is that word prajna that is, or panna in the Pali, but prajna in Sanskrit. And this is one of those ideas, again, that becomes a cornerstone of Mahayana Buddhism, the very idea of this wisdom. But it's present in the early tradition. Again, it's the wisdom that is developed through samadhi. 
And it's ultimately defined, at least most of the time, it's the wisdom that understands no self. That, that very idea of there not being a subject, that's normally the definition of pranya in that way. There can be other definitions of it, but that's the idea. And then a forest dwelling bhikkhu should apply himself to the Abhidharma and the Abhivinaya. There are those who ask a forest dwelling bhikkhu a question about the higher dharma and the higher discipline. And if when asked, he fails to reply, well, there will be those who would say of him, what is this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest doing as he likes, since when he's asked a question about the higher dharma and the higher discipline, he fails to reply. Since there will be those who would say of them, a forest dwelling bhikkhu should apply himself to the higher, since there will be those that would say that of him. A forest dwelling bhikkhu should apply himself to the Abhidharma and the Abhivinaya. So, we've heard the term Abhidharma before, but Abhivinaya? That's a new one. It was new to me. Um, very quickly, though, let me remind you that the Abhidharma is, you know, it's this idea of the, the higher Dharma. But in my experience, you know, the Abhidharma is, it's kind of all centered around the lists, all the lists that the Buddha gave. I've even given you a few lists tonight, the five spiritual faculties and so on. So the idea is, is that the Abhidharma is like all the lists, all the teachings. And so a forest dweller out there was sort of going through all the teachings, going through all the lists in that way. And even though I haven't been able to find an exact definition of the Abhivinaya, I would presume that it's the same idea in terms of learning all of the precepts and sort of the, the, the deeper sort of backbone of the precepts. As you may know, the, um, actually you may not know this. There's a giant, giant collection of teachings of the Buddha that we call the Vinaya or the Vinaya, the discipline. That collection of all these teachings of the Buddha has not only all the rules of which, you know, for monastics, at least male monastics, there's like 250 of these different rules. But the Vinaya is interesting because it actually tells the backstory of how every single rule came to be. What happens is, is that all of the actual rules, like all the precepts, they get taken out of the vinaya and uh, get established in a list. And this list is known as the prati moksha, uh, that which moves towards moksha, liberation. And the prati moksha is the list of the rules that monastics recite on the new moon and the full moon traditionally. All the monastics get together, they shave their heads, they chant the prati moksha. So it would seem, at least my deduction, is that you, you often hear the rules, the prati moksha, you often hear that referred to as the Vinaya, as the discipline or the rules. So my understanding of the Abhi Vinaya is the studying of the entire Vinaya where you learn where those rules came from and maybe their connection to other rules. So this sort of like meta Vinaya. So again, the references to the forest dwelling monks studying Abhidharma, I've seen that. 
but I have never seen this term Abhi Vinaya before. So, Noam, did you have a comment, idea? Um, is it, isn't it true that most of the precepts have to do, now, as soon as I started saying it, I realized probably not true, but the, don't a lot of the precepts or most of them have to do with interaction with other people? Or not? Um, yes, a lot of them do. A lot of them do. So it seems like it would be less uh, important for a forest dweller who's solitary, right? And also just makes me think about sort of which is more challenging to be, uh, you know, a monk in a community or to be a monk alone in the forest. And I'm sure it depends on the human being and what they find more challenging. But anyway, just thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no. And, and something that... Um maybe I kind of didn't make clear in that way at the beginning when we were talking about the forest dwellers, but, you know, something that's being, you know, it's what this sutta is about, actually. To be an Aranyaka or a forest dweller, that would be only like, uh, bye guys, I'm going to the forest to do a retreat, but I'll see you soon. I'm coming back. And so knowing all the rules for begging and decorum and comportment are important even for the forest dweller because they, have, they don't live out there all the time. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right. So we only have two more steps to go. So we've put forth the effort. We've done our sati mindfulness, gotten into samadhi, developed this pranya wisdom that allows us to study the higher teachings, the abhidharma and abhivinaya. And then that leads us to a forest dwelling bhikkhu should apply himself to those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms. There are those, there are people who ask a forest-dwelling bhikkhu a question on the liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms. If, when so asked, he fails to reply, there will be those who would say of him, what has this venerable forest-dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since when he's asked a question about those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms, he fails to reply. Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest-dwelling bhikkhu should apply himself to those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial transcending forms. So this, this one is why I sort of defined samadhi the way I did in terms of it sort of being focused, concentrated, a sense of oneness in that way. I did that because that was earlier, and now we're talking about the immaterial liberations, transcending form. So this, of course, is what we are talking about is the Arupa Dattu, the formless realm. And the formless realm, of course, is those deep, deep meditative states, normally called samadhis or formless jhanas, infinite space, infinite consciousness, infinite nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. So those are the states that are being spoken about here. These are, of course, kind of in many ways what the forest dweller has gone to cultivate in many ways. A lot of the forest dwelling activity is about the, the conditions for getting into these really deep formless jhanas. So that's the idea of that. But notice too, though, that it's about the forest dweller's ability to an answer questions to people about those immaterial formless realms. So it's, it's more than just a forest dweller should cultivate them. It's they should cultivate them so that when people ask, they can give them some information about it. So. And then, finally, a forest-dwelling bhikkhu should apply himself to the superhuman state. 
There are those who ask a forest-dwelling Biko a question about the superhuman state. If, when so asked, he fails to reply, there will be those who would say of him, what has this venerable forest dweller gained by his dwelling alone in the forest, doing as he likes, since he does not even know the purpose for the sake of which he went forth? Since there would be those who would say this of him, a forest-dwelling bhikkhu should apply himself to the superhuman state. So, Manusa Dhamma is the is what it is in Pali, this idea of a superhuman state. Um, I won't keep you in suspense, of course, but a superhuman state is considered the arahat. It could be even the anagaman sh chakra dagaman and the shotopana, like sometimes stream entry. Once returner, non returner are also considered superhuman states. But here I think they're talking about the highest goal of early Buddhism, the arahat, in that way. That again is the very point. That's the very reason why the person has gone to the forest, anyways. But I do want to talk for a moment about this phrase, this idea of the superhuman state. So I kind of have two like main things that I want to say about this. I think the first thing that I'll say about this is there's a whole kind of like uh, history, if you will. And it's the, I, I've even given a, a lecture on this. You might've seen my, me give a presentation on this, but there's a whole kind of history to um, the English-speaking world's interest in Buddhism. So I'm talking about like mid to late 19th century uh, European philosophers. I'm talking like Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and then over in England, I'm talking about the like early Theosophical Society people, Madame Blavatsky. So like all of the mid to late 19th century, uh, like Occidental Western interest in Buddhism, it was almost entirely about this idea of the, what Nietzsche called the Ubermunch the the overman or the superman as it's often translated so if you if you've read any nietzsche and you're familiar with his famous phrase the ubermunch the superman he's referring to this this idea so the very idea of like a superhuman beyond a human that became a, a big interest again, to the Theosophical Society people, but also the, like the really hardcore European philosophers. And, well, so I just wanted you to know that, that the early Western interest in Buddhism, it was because the Buddhists were talking about this, a program for reaching a superhuman state. And they were talking about it like, you know, if you've read the Visuddhimagga, if you've read the, the Path to Purification, which is a very, very old Buddhist meditation manual, it's a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a superhuman. <laughs> and again, that's what a lot of people were interested in. So there's that. The other thing that's related to that, though, that I want to talk about is I want to talk about... <laughs> What does it mean to be superhuman? Like, what are they talking about? Well, as I understand it, and, you know, it's the way that I teach Buddhism in that way. The basic idea, again, this is just me. This is the way I understand it. But it seems to me that the Buddha or Buddhism is very, very aware of what we would call kind of 
evolutionary biological programming. The basic idea is, is that the Buddha or Buddhism is very aware that this thing, the, the mammalian body, is built to reproduce. It is built to seek out sensory input. It is built to do all of these things. And so the Buddha or Buddhism recognizes that to, to get angry is normal. It's regular. It's part of the program. To want and desire things is normal. It's a regular part of the program. All of these things like sexuality, even tendencies towards drunkenness, these are considered to be normal parts of the program. But the point is to go against the programming is radical. And if you succeed in going against the stream, and by the way, that's where that phrase comes from, the stream is evolutionary biological programming that wants you to reproduce, buy stuff, get angry, fight, kill. That's the program. Buddhism is saying, don't be violent. Don't give in to your every sensual desire. And Buddhism recognizes that that is hard. <laughs> Nobody is saying it's easy. And in, in fact, they're saying that it's entirely against your programming to do it. But the point is, and this is the whole point of Buddhism, is that if you go against the stream and you start chipping away at that conditioning, you can reach a superhuman state. And it's superhuman because human is going that direction. Human is giving in to the desires and giving in to the anger. So I just wanted to kind of really clarify what we mean by superhuman. Not getting angry. That is superhuman. You know, it's like, I know that, you know, I know Superman can fly and, you know, uh, break steel or whatever, right? But can he not get angry? because <laughs> that's the real superpower right so that's my my little you can do it like encouragement for being a superhuman right that is the idea oh and by the way the beauty the really beautiful thing about buddhism too is anybody can do it a male female young old uh crippled you name it there are records of people all kinds of people going against the stream and becoming superhuman. So it's another thing that uh, I love. I hope you love about Buddhism that way. It's like super all-inclusive. So, All right. So that's the last step, reaching a superhuman state. Again, that's usually kind of an arhat in that way. And then we get a very, very, very beautiful ender to this sutta. Now, on the note of superhuman states and like the idea of like being superhuman, nobody represents that better than Madhuryayana. And it's interesting that he's the one that steps up and says, so when Sariputra had said all of this, the Venerable Maha Mangalyana asked the Venerable Sariputra, Friend Sariputta, should these things that you just talked about, should these things be undertaken and practiced only by a forest-dwelling bhikkhu or by one who dwells near a village as well? Friend Mangalyana, Sariputra said, these things should be undertaken and practiced even by a forest-dwelling bhikkhu. How much more so than by one who dwells near a village? And you could take that as everybody should be practicing these, not just forest-dwelling monastics. So...
All right. Any questions, comments, ideas about Sariputra's advice to the forest dweller? Yeah, Noe. Well, thank you, Michael. Yeah, uh, I'm going to jump back to something earlier, which Do was it. the thing about you know the energy, you know, mm. of, the, of having all of this. What a what a great sutra! I really uh, appreciate hearing this today. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but the thing about energy is that, that something that I may have gotten it wrong. So, so there's a funny thing about transmission in in say Soto Zen, you, 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 you are transmitted, you do these things. And then I transmit to you your name and this and that. And so I'm kind of like, that's that question. Is there transmission in Buddhism? I mean, I know there is in Soto Zen because that's how they base it on. It's all transmitted from teacher to student to, 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 to all the way back to Siddhartha Gautama. So, mm -hmm. But, but what mentioned here, this thing about energetic mm -hmm. uh, to obtain, uh, yeah. So, so mm -hmm. what about transmission question? Thank you. I would love to say a few things about transmission. I'm not quite sure I see the connection with Virya, the energy. I mean, I, I kind of do maybe in terms of your line of thinking. So allow me, I'll just mention something about transmission. So if you, if anybody else out there isn't familiar within the world of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism in particular, but actually it's part of a lot of traditions of Buddhism, there is what is known as a transmission, could be a transmission of the Dharma, could be, it's, let's just leave it at a transmission. And there's a lot of like, I get this question a lot, actually, Noe, about like, what exactly is going on with transmission? And, you know, there's sort of a very big, broad spectrum in terms of how to understand that. Because, I mean, there's sort of like, um, in terms of like the spectrum, on one hand, on one end of the spectrum down here, it's it's very mundane and it's about basically like mm, empowering somebody to teach. And so there's like, it's practically a certificate. Very, very quotidian. That's like at this end of the spectrum of transmission. At this end of the spectrum, it's very magical. There's something incredibly magical going on because especially in the Zen tradition, what's going on is that there's actually a transmission of teachings happening without words or letters, as they say. It's an unspoken transmission of the Dharma. That's, again, down at this more magical end. Now, Noe, you know, because I know that you're involved in that, in the Zen tradition, I want to remind you that the original transmission, like the first transmission of the Dharma, that is the reference point for all transmissions of the Dharma, it's that the reference point, grab my prop, but it's that sutta where the Buddha holds up the flower and only kashyapya, only Kashyapya smiled. And it said that in that moment, there was this a secret transmission of the Dharma that made Kashyapya the Buddha. And by that, I mean no different than the Buddha. Like, it, it's like, oh, you if you've got a question for the Buddha... You can just ask Kashyapya now because there's no difference between the Buddha and Kashyapya in that way. So the transmission ceremony or the transmission thing is, is well, generally it's more about lineages, succession, and all of that. I, I no, though I was thinking about it, about this, that that one, because I was thinking that a really funny, like, new version. Hey, Noe, tra I transmitted the Dharma to Noe. 
I hope everybody saw that. <laughs> but that's sort of, so again, that's sort of on the magical side where with just a gesture, the, the Dharma is transmitted and then it can become just sort of a matter of authorities. But my pleasure, Noe. Thanks. Great. Good question. All right, everybody, we did it. We did another sutta, sutta number 69. That's it for this week. Any last comments or ideas or announcements, anything? 